Good morning, First Covenant Church. Hey, I'm the one over here. This is Becca Gamboa alongside some familiar faces that you might see here on the platform this morning. We are so excited to be together in order to lead you in worship today. So would you please stand with me wherever you are, stand up, and if you want to greet one another, you can because this is your family. Go ahead and greet one another. These are the people that you're going to be worshiping alongside. Take your moment. Say hello. We'll keep a distance. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Awesome. Well, as we remain standing, let us uh, begin with this invitation to worship. We who are Christians worship Monday through Saturday with life and work and school, wherever and whenever we are conscious that the Spirit partners our journey. But Sunday worship is unique. From our separate ways, we join hearts and voices together to proclaim we are the body of Christ. We choose to be festive about our songs of praise and seek dialogue with the living God. So let us begin another week with resurrection spirit, praising God for who God is and what God does.
Well, good morning, everyone. If you're standing up, you may be seated. This morning, I'm going to be reading from, to you from Psalms 116. I want to encourage you, if you have your Bible next to you, pull it out, open up to Psalm 116. Maybe you have your First Covenant Church app, open it up, and follow along in, to Psalm 116. I'd also encourage you just to read along on the screen, beginning at verse 1. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came over me. I was overcome by distress and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. And verse 12. What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. Truly, I am your servant, Lord. I serve you just as my mother did. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Father God, we thank you uh, that we get to be your servants, Lord. Um, not just today but every day, every day of the week, Lord, we get to serve you. But Father God, we confess that we often find ourselves locked behind, uh, behind fear and behind doubt, much, Lord, like your disciples. But thank you for the breath of your Holy Spirit uh, and that although, Lord, our physical church doors are closed, it is by your Holy Spirit that dwells in us that your church is always open. It's open at the kitchen table while we're doing school, Lord, and, and it's open at, uh, at work, and it's open as we go for walks out on the beautiful days, Lord, and we thank you. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. A couple of announcements for us. I just want to invite you, if you haven't already, to download the church app, the First Covenant Church app. This is a wonderful way for you to remain connected to First Covenant Church. We are loading all kinds of content onto the app, and you can access that content, all of it designed to help you know Jesus and to make Jesus known in your community. Right from the church app, there's a, a great way for you to submit prayer requests so we can be praying with you and for you. You can effortlessly reach out through email to any of the church staff. You may fill out a virtual connect card and request that your email be added to our weekly email chain. Even if you are so inclined, you may give uh, financially support through the ministries of First Covenant Church and you can make financial contributions right over the church app. So if you've not yet done so, please download the church app onto your smartphone or onto your tablet. What I'm most excited about with the church app is that every week we are releasing devotional material that's tied directly to the Sunday sermon. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us as a church to all be studying the same scripture texts together throughout the week. So those uh, are made live every morning, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Join us for worship on Sunday and then reflect on the text on Monday and Tuesday. Here at First Covenant Church, our values are that we are biblical, we are relational, we are devotional, and we are missional. And even though we might not be able to join together in the same space, our values have not changed. And so even though we are scattered about, we live out those values in ways that help us know Jesus better and make Jesus known in our community. So that being said, let's turn our attention here to this morning's message. Our current sermon series is entitled Encounters. And this series is, is intended to be a series that, that carves out 
space for you to experience peace in the midst of fear, anxiety, maybe even desperation. It's intended that you might know purpose that extended far beyond our current reality that we find ourselves in, an eternal purpose. And it's my prayer that you would know through this series and encounter the power that God gives to you and me through the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. Peace, purpose, and power. Throughout this series, we will be looking at the encounters that the disciples had or followers of Jesus had with the risen Lord from the time after he rose and before he ascended into heaven. And these encounters change their lives. It's my prayer that through our study and interaction with these encounters, that the Holy Spirit might change our lives as well. So would you pray with me? Gracious God, as we gather together this morning in our living rooms and around our kitchen tables, we ask that you would knit us together by your Holy Spirit. God, may the words that come out of my mouth today, may they be true, may they be helpful, and may ultimately, God, may they be glorifying to you. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning's encounter is found in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 24 and going through verse 29. It comes on the heels of last week's encounter with the disciples. Again, John chapter 20, 24 through 29. Please follow along with me. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. This morning's encounter focuses on Thomas. And from this encounter, we learn something about ourselves. Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we're probably a lot more like Thomas than we would like to admit. More importantly, we discover something important about Jesus, which in turn invites you and me to consider how we will respond to the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's start with talking about Thomas. Last week, we explored the resurrection day appearance of Jesus to his disciples, which took place in this exact same room that this morning's passage takes place in, a room that they had locked themselves up in for fear of the Jewish authorities. This morning, we are in that same room again. But there were only 10 of the disciples that were there with Jesus the, the week earlier. Judas had already hanged himself, and for whatever reason, Thomas was not with them. He missed the meeting. So after Jesus appears to the 10 that were gathered, they seek out Thomas and they tell him, we have seen the risen Lord. And Thomas naturally has his doubts. Their story sounds too fantastic to be true. He says, unless I can see it for myself. In fact, Thomas adds, unless I can take my finger and if I can't touch his wounds, if I can't put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas needs evidence. The testimonies of the other 10 apostles aren't enough for him. I hate to admit it, but I can kind of relate to Thomas. 
I can understand where Thomas is coming from. Thomas has his doubts. But interestingly enough, Thomas's doubts don't lead him away from an encounter with Jesus, but rather towards an encounter with Jesus. And that is a crucial point to get our heads around this morning. Earlier in John's account, uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. And he tells them, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to prepare a place for you and then I'll come back for you. You know the way to the place I am going and so you know where to find me. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Therefore, we don't know the way. And Jesus answers him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I fear sometimes that within the church, we kind of create this perception that it is unacceptable to have any doubts or questions. Sometimes, whether it's to our own children, maybe somebody told it to us, somebody at some point just said, you know, stop asking those questions. You just have to accept it on faith. You just have to believe. And for much, that, that is absolutely true. I'm not trying to, to not say that that's the case. There are things that we can't understand, but that doesn't mean that we can't question things. I think questioning things helps us grow in our understanding and an awareness of our faith. I don't think that as Christians we are to simply cling to a blind faith. This is especially true when asking some of the existential questions dealing with life and death, eternity, heaven and, and hell. I believe when Jesus says that he is the way and the truth and the life. I believe that, but I came to that conclusion not because I never questioned or had doubts, but because I did have questions and I did have doubts. And rather than being told in the church, Chris, don't ask that question or you're not allowed to have those doubts, people invited me in. They invited me in and we sat down and we had the opportunity to work through my doubts and my questions. You see, what matters in Thomas's life is not that he has doubts and questions, but that he brings his doubts into the room with the other disciples. You see, I believe because Thomas was with them in that room, it shows that Thomas wanted to believe. He had his doubts, but he wanted to believe. He just needed to see for himself. Thomas didn't call the other disciples a bunch of religious loonies and walk away from them. Thomas chose to stick with them, even though he had his doubts. It was Thomas's desire to believe that led him to that room that day. He needed to see for himself that Jesus had in fact conquered the grave that Jesus was in fact the way, the truth, and the life. Church, having doubts is okay. The question you need to ask yourself is, do you want to believe? Yes, I have these doubts, but do I want to believe? And I'm not suggesting that you have to blindly believe. The opposite is true. And Jesus backs this up. Do you want to believe in the truth? If so, Seek out Jesus who says, I am the truth. So you bring your doubts to Jesus as you start your journey. But if you say to yourself, I don't want to believe, then it doesn't matter what compelling evidence is placed before you. In this we find, I had so many conversations with people who want to argue about Christianity, who want to argue about Jesus as Messiah. They don't want to believe in him. They want to argue against him. And I've discovered it really doesn't matter what I say, nothing will change their heart. Only God can do that. If you want to believe, like Thomas, we can bring our doubts to the room and encounter Jesus. 
I know I can relate to Thomas, and maybe you can too. He had his doubts, but he also wanted to believe. Thomas was waiting in that locked room with an anticipation and a desire to believe what his friends had told him was true. But this passage, while it's a wonderful story of Thomas, is primarily about Jesus. Let's go back to the text. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. I believe, I, I think, as I read this passage, that, that John wants us to realize that Jesus shows up and meets the doubter right where he's at. When you compare this scene, this text, to last week's text, where we explored verses 19 through 22 of chapter 20, there is so much that is a carbon copy. They're almost identical. In fact, they are in the same room. The disciples, seven days later, have gone back to the same place. They locked themselves in again. Jesus appears to them in a locked room again. He says the exact same greeting to them again. Peace be with you. But this time, Jesus looks at Thomas and calls him out directly. He finds the doubter in the room. And he invites Thomas towards him. And whereas the week before he showed, he said, look at my hands, look at my side. He goes to Thomas and he says, I invite you to put your hand on my wounds. Put your hand in my side. Jesus meets the doubter right where he's at. Jesus, in fact, goes the extra distance to close that gap that existed between he and Thomas. Jesus showed up to overcome Thomas's doubt. This is what you need to know about Jesus this morning. If you have your doubt, fine. Jesus is pursuing you. He's not condemning you. He's not shaming you. He's not blaming you. He is pursuing you. And Jesus is ready to meet you in the middle of your doubt and provide you evidence that you need to believe if you want to believe. You see, Jesus had selected earlier, Jesus had selected Thomas as one of the 12. And when Jesus selected Thomas, it's because Thomas had a purpose in the kingdom of God that Jesus was there to introduce. And Jesus wasn't about to let the fact that Thomas missed last week's meeting to interfere with him living into his God-given purpose that would have eternal significance for countless numbers of people around the world. Jesus was not going to let that happen, and so he shows up in the middle of Thomas's doubt. He goes the extra distance to seek him out. Throughout the gospel account of John, Jesus is reaching out to people. And he tells Thomas as he reaches out to him, stop doubting and believe. Which leads us to Thomas's response and ours. Thomas responds in belief by professing my Lord and my God. Believing and professing, which is to proclaim something with words. This belief and profession concept is central to our understanding as Christians of what it means to follow Jesus as Savior and Lord. It's central to our understanding of what it means to be saved and what it means to have new life in Jesus Christ. In John's Gospel, there were people who believed in Jesus but refused to acknowledge it for fear. In the account that John gives he kind of sheds a negative light on those people because what we are meant to do is to believe and also profess and proclaim. The Apostle Paul says this to the church in Rome. 
If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Thomas professes his belief. He wanted to believe, but he had his doubts. Jesus showed up and removed all of those doubts. Jesus then gives a final word of direction, not only to Thomas, but really to you and me and all who have sought after Jesus following his ascension to heaven. Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. That's you and me. Jesus declares us blessed. Not because we don't have doubts or questions, but because we worked through them and came to a place of believing without having to be eyewitnesses. We can trust the testimonies of others. Jesus actually says, Thomas, yeah, I get that you needed to see my wounds. You needed to see the, where they pierced me in my side. You needed to touch me. But blessed are those who believe without seeing. And that's us. That's you. And that's me. To the doubter, Jesus says, come, bring your doubts. Bring your doubts into the presence of Jesus so that you might experience peace. To the doubter, Jesus meets you exactly where you are at. Why? Because like it or not, you have a God-given purpose on this earth. It's an eternal, significant purpose, and it's tied to the risen Jesus Christ. And to the doubter, Jesus says, believe, receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and live a life of testimony proclaiming Jesus is Lord and God. There's good news for the doubters. There is peace, there is purpose, and there is power and a dependence in the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, thank you for going the extra distance to seek out the doubters and the doubt that is in each and every one of us. God, we know that our faith sometimes is small, that the things we can't see fall away in favor of the things that we can see and that we can interact with right in front of us. And God, we confess that so often this pulls us away from you instead of pushing us deeper into a relationship with you. So God, we confess that and we pray for your blessing that we who live in this time, especially in this time, that though we may not be able to see with our eyes, that we may nonetheless believe, that we may encounter your peace, that we may embrace your purposes for us, and that we might know your power through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. God, we continue to lift up those in our um, fellowship who at this time are feeling uncertain, unnerved, feeling anxious. God, we know that as this pandemic continues through not only our nation and our state, but around the world, that there's fear. And God, we ask that you would meet us in our fear. God, we know that there's so much confusing and conflicting reports that, that it just forces us to kind of doubt anything. God, may we not doubt that you are still God and that you sit on the throne and that you are in control. Help us rest in that peace, Lord. We continue, God, to lift up and pray for our leaders. We pray for those who are serving in our hospitals and who are on the front lines of this. Protect them and their families, Lord, we ask. And God, in all these things, we know that our hearts are heavy, but we don't want them to be hard. We want to open our lives up to you, to know you, and to love you more. 
So in these things, Lord, we pray in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. downloaded the church app. It's a great way to stay connected. Please follow along with the devotional material that we have provided, a wonderful way to engage with the, the Sunday text and stay connected in that way as well. Now hear this word of benediction. Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. <laughs>